and welcome to chapter 16 of the OpenStack Psychology Textbook. My name is Matthew Poole and today we're going over therapy and treatment. So in this chapter we're going to be going over a history of mental health treatments in regards to how people used to think mental illness and mental health was a result of, as well as we're going to look at the history of asylums and how we get to treatment today with our mental health hospitals. So to begin with, and we've talked about this in previous chapters, especially in chapter two, when it comes to mental health difficulties, what people back in the day used to think they were a result of was a few things. Firstly, due to uh, demonic possession or witchcraft, uh, as well as some sort of other supernatural causes. So one of the ways in which individuals would try and treat mental difficulties back in the day was a process known as trephining. Through this process, they would drill a hole in individual skull into their frontal lobe, and more specifically their prefrontal cortex, and they thought this was a potential to be able to uh, let the demons out or let whatever supernatural cause out of the brain. Other ways in which individuals would do so is through execution or imprisonment. So I guess if you put the mental health illness as well as the person out of sight and out of mind, I guess in a way, did you treat the mental illness? I guess so, but it was not productive for the individual in question. So I'm glad we have a lot more ethical ways in which we can treat mental difficulties, but uh, earlier on it was uh, definitely pretty gruesome and uh, unethical to say the least. Another way in which individuals would try to treat mental difficulties was through exorcism. So a less invasive way, physically speaking, was whenever they would bring in a priest or a religious figure, and what they would do is they would uh, spout incantations and or prayers over the individual's body to hopefully expel the demon from the body or the brain in this case. Now, in the 18th century, this is whenever we see an uptick in asylums. So individuals used to be institutionalized, but the beginning asylums, especially um, outside of the United States um, and in France more particularly, they were really horrific uh, institutions. They basically just ostracized and imprisoned people from the public. Um, so to give a definition to asylums, they were the first institutions created for the specific purpose of housing people with psychological disorders. And so where they would be kept was often in like window windowless dungeons. They were chained to beds and they were offered little to no contact from, with their caregivers. So obviously these individuals did not receive any sort of alleviation of their mental difficulties if, and if anything, it either stagnated or worsened and a lot of times probably worsened. Now, there was uh, an individual named Felipe Pinel in the late 1700s, so we're to the 18th century at this point still, and he was a French physician. He argued uh, for more humane treatment of the mentally ill. He suggested, hey, maybe we should, I don't know, unchain these people and maybe talk to them a little bit. And believe it or not, because of this, through, the, as, as I guess you could say, an earlier form of psychotherapy or talk therapy, individuals were, um, they benefited from this and some were able to be released from the quote-unquote hospital or asylums. Now, toward the 19th century, we've got Dorothy Dix. She was a social reformer who became an advocate for individuals who were experiencing mental difficulties. She investigated the state of care for the mentally ill and poor and discovered an underfunded and unregulated system that perpetuated the abuse of the mentally ill. So she was hugely instrumental in um, creating an, the first asylums here in the United States. Now, here in the United States, they still weren't especially, um, I mean, at the beginning they had good intentions, but it got to the point where it was almost like they were just testing different treatments out of the blue to see what stuck. And um, as a result, too, they these asylums were not kept up very well. So they were usually pretty filthy. They offered little treatment, and the treatment they did offer was unethical as well as harmful to the individuals and many uh, caused death in these people. Um, and so because these treatments weren't effective, 
for obvious reasons, they were often institutionalized for decades, so many did not even receive an alleviation of their mental difficulties. So some of these treatments included submerging individuals into cold baths for long periods of time, electroshock treatment, and so uh, what this does is it essentially produces like a generalized seizure in the, in the individual. And so that was believed at the time to alleviate mental difficulties. But um, a lot of these treatments, among others, uh, ended up killing people. So toward the 20th century, we get a little bit better in the sense of introducing psychotropics and antipsychotic medications. So in 1954, these were when they were when they were first introduced, and they were given to individuals who were diagnosed with what's known as psychosis, because we didn't have the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders at this time. Um, we didn't have the correct verbiage for schizophrenia, and we know, as we've established in Chapter 15, schizophrenia uh, can include symptoms of psychosis, which are simply hallucinations. So seeing and hearing things that are not congruent with, with reality and delusions or beliefs about the world that are incongruent with reality. And whenever these antipsychotic medications were introduced, people saw significant improvement. Now in 1975, this is whenever we have acts that come into place that uh, begin the process of deinstitutionalization. So this is quite simply the closing of asylums and uh, allowing people to return to society and seek outpatient uh, care. Now, this was not a smooth transition by any stretch. You can uh, find the data anywhere online that shows whenever these individuals were deinstitutionalized um, and we have an increase of mental health hospitals, there is an increase in homelessness as well as imprisonment because the main thing with psychological disorders is that costs uh, significant distress and impairment in, in, in individuals' ability to operate and function normally in society. So obviously, if you're not able to operate normally or have dysfunction to your ability to work, then how are you supposed to create an income for yourself, have a fruitful life where you're able to take care of yourself and even a family? So that's why we see uh, an increase in homelessness uh, as well as imprisonment as a result of this deinstitutionalization. Um, and mental health hospitals today, they are uh, getting better for sure, but the thing is, is they're focused on short-term treatment, and they're not, individuals are not there as long as they should be. And this is due to a variety of, of factors, but especially insurance. Insurance is a thing, and the cost for mental health treatment is exponential. So uh, if we can get to the point to where mental health treatment is affordable, I think that will be advantageous for everybody. It shouldn't be just exclusive to individuals who have uh, the financial means to seek treatment. Now, there are two forms of mental health treatment as far as how people get to a, a psychiatric hospital or a mental health hospital. Um, a good portion of people uh, have to go be, uh, against their will um, and or due to court order. And this is what's known as involuntary treatment. So therapy is not the individual's choice. So this includes weekly counseling sessions, um, or short-term stay in a, in a mental health hospital. Next is voluntary treatment where an individual does actually choose to obtain relief from their symptoms of mental difficulties. Um, I guess before I, I start with the types of treatment, if you are struggling with mental difficulties, the very first step is to uh, seek advice from your uh, primary care physician or your primary, whoever you seek for primary care. They will uh, refer you to a counselor in the area or an organization that will set you up with a counselor. Okay, so types of treatment we've got different uh, approaches as well as ideologies. Uh, in, uh, under psychotherapy that we're going to go over the earliest form, which is psychoanalysis with Freud. We're also going to talk about play therapy, behavior therapy, cognitive, put it together. And a lot of individuals use this today as cognitive behavioral therapy, the humanistic approach to therapy, as well as biomedical therapies, including psychotropics. So medications that you take for the alleviation of mental difficulties. So psychotherapy, this is your 
uh, usually your one-on-one -on -one or even in a group uh, session where you uh, are with a licensed uh, counselor and you seek treatment for your mental difficulties. So your basic talk therapy. And under that, your, your counselor or your therapist will have a particular approach that they, that they have. All right, and we'll go through some of those. The biomedical therapy, again, these are the medications or medical procedures to treat psychological disorders. We've talked about in previous chapters, uh, one of the most common psychotropic or biomedical therapy approach used is an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is used to alleviate symptoms of anxiety and or depression. So psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is the early, one of the earliest forms of psychotherapy developed by Sigmund Freud. And what Freud did and how Freud went about this was through a process known as free association. So this is essentially just saying whatever comes to mind. And Freud, it's Freud's uh, job or the psychoanalyst's job to make connections to the unconscious mind. And he thinks that whenever you bring what's unconscious to consciousness, that's at least the first step in alleviating that difficulty. Now, another thing that Freud tried to do was analyze your dreams. And although, uh, as we know now, we don't have an objective or unbiased way in which we can analyze your dreams, it didn't stop him from trying to interpret these underlying meanings of your dreams. Okay? Moving forward. So a lot of people, when they think of psychology, they think of this couch and lying down. And Freud did uh, do this where individuals, he thought that it, when you put individuals in a comfortable place where they're relaxed, they're more likely to share uh, information about themselves rather than just a cold and sterile environment. They feel boxed in or just uncomfortable in general. However, in counseling today, you're likely not going to be lying on a couch and you're just going to be sitting next to the to the therapist or across from them in a chair. Play therapy. This is often used for children or individuals who uh, may be on the spectrum because expressing themselves and verbalizing what's going on can be uh, or is difficult. They, they're not going to articulate themselves as clearly or as understandably as an adult would. So this is where play therapy comes into play, and most commonly what individuals will use is sand play or sand tray therapy, where children can set up a three-dimensional world using various figures and objects that correspond to their inner state. And this can happen uh, a couple ways too, and it, if you just want to play house with the child or the individual, then um, you can set up a house situation and either have the individual do non-directive or directive play therapy. Now, non-directive play therapy are when children are just encouraged to uh, play freely and um, either play things out at home, things like that. So you're just giving them different toys and they are to um, just play with them freely. Now, directive play therapy, can they will provide more structure. So such as, you know, what's a typical, what happens at home, like what's the situation, and th that will... Uh, you know, allow the child to give you more specifics on maybe what be what is going on at home uh, or otherwise. Okay, behavior therapy. When it comes to behavior therapy, this is whenever we're changing undesirable behaviors into more constructive ones. Okay, and there are a number of ways in which we can uh, employ this approach. Some people. Uh, can use aversive conditioning. This has to be done very carefully. It uses an unpleasant stimulus to stop an undesirable behavior. So for, for individuals who have um, an addiction, especially, let's say specifically to alcohol, individuals can take what's known as antabuse. Antabuse is a substance that will induce vomiting and nausea when combined with alcohol. And so this is a way to aversively condition you to whenever you see, smell, or taste alcohol, you will have a negative um, experience as a result of it because you had, you had that one instance where you either vomited or had uncontrollable nausea whenever you consumed the alcohol. All right? Exposure therapy. This is whenever we systematically reintroduce a once uh, adversive or unpleasant stimulus uh, and... Uh, creating a more 
creating more control for your anxiety in the moment or being able to get over that hump in general. Because we know that uh, as far as anxiety goes, one way to continue to reinforce it is to avoid it. And if you're wanting to uh, tackle that anxious stimulus or anxiety provoking stimulus, then the best way to get through it, as long as it doesn't cause extreme uh, uh, is an extreme thre threat to your health or well-being, then we'll uh, sl slowly expose that to you because exposure is the best uh, tool that we can use to treat uh, like phobias and things like that. So for individuals who have a fear of public speaking, slowly introducing um, a crowd or slowly getting involved in public speaking will allow you to get through that uh, anxiety or at least make it more manageable. You may not be completely unanxious, but you can at least be able to manage it while you're doing it. All right. So another way that we can, uh, this is a very elementary example, but uh, it just goes to show how we can reintroduce it reintroduce an unpleasant stimulus. So Mary Cover Jones, she developed the first type of exposure therapy. So an unconditioned stimulus is presented over and over just after the presentation of the conditioned stimulus. So in this in this regard, the conditioned stimulus is a bunny. Let's say that we've got a fear or, of rabbits. Let's say we've got a fear of rabbits. All right. Now an unconditioned stimulus that elicits a positive response with us is our favorite snack. So for um, Peter here, he, he loves cookies and milk. So let's say that one day we have a bunny in the corner of the room and we have a little Peter here enjoying his snack while the uh, unpleasant condition stimulus is far away from them. And each day we move slow, uh, we move slower and slower toward the uh, bunny while trying to associate a pleasant experience with this once unpleasant uh, object or thing. And so eventually, after two months, Peter was able to be able to pet the rabbit while eating his snack. Cognitive therapy. This was developed by Aaron Beck in the 1960s. He is foc he was focused on changing unhealthy perspectives and unhealthy thoughts and putting them into more productive ones. Okay, So cognitive therapists help clients become aware of their cognitive cognitive distortions because awareness is key here and some examples of these cognitive difficulties or thought difficulties includes overgeneralization, taking a small situation and making it bigger than it needs to be, polarized thinking which includes black and white thinking, I'm either perfect or a failure, this is common in individuals who experience depression, as well as jumping to conclusions, assuming that people are thinking negatively about you or reacting negatively to you without evidence. All right, so this is an example of a el very elementary example of assisting an individual through um, an unhealthy perspective that can lead to depression. So let's say an individual fails a test, and naturally they just say, well, I'm worthless and stupid. That's their internal belief. That's their cognition. So that leads to a more depressive outlook. But a cognitive therapist goal here would be, okay, we failed the test. Let's look at this in a different way. I'm smart, but I didn't study for this test. I can do better. There are ways to get around this and attack the problem head on. So that is a more positive and motivating outlook that does not lead to a state of depression. So we're simply uh, taking the cognition here from an unhealthy one to a healthy outlook. Now let's put it together, cognitive behavioral therapy. So we're in this case, we're changing your unhealthy thoughts to more productive ones while also changing unhealthy behaviors into more productive ones. So um, as a result of this, this works to change cognitive distortions and self-defeating behavior. Aims to change how people, uh, how people think and how they act. Okay. Humanistic therapy. This focuses on helping people achieve their potential. The goal is to increase self-awareness and acceptance through the focus on conscious thoughts. So again, humanistic um, therapists, they believe for the potential and good that's innate to humans and that needs to just be facilitated out of them from the therapist. The therapist believes in this case that the individual is the master of their own life and that the Solutions to their problems are within them. It just needs to be facilitated by the therapist. So a few techniques that are used 
in this, and created by Carl Rogers, by the way, is active listening, unconditional positive regard, as well as genuineness, empathy, and acceptance toward clients. So when it comes to active listening, this is actually being able to acknowledge what the individual is saying and restating it back to the person to clarify what the client is expressing. So this is a technique used so that individuals not only feel heard, but supported and accepted by their therapist by hearing back what they are saying. And it's just so that, and it's another reason to help both the uh, client and the therapist being on the same page. When it comes to un unconditional positive regard, the therapist does not judge the client and simply accepts them for who they are. So no matter where they've come from, no matter what they've done, the therapist's goal in this instance is to leave their biases as best they can at the door and meet the person for who they are, no matter what they've done and where they have been. Treat them as a person, okay? as well as genuineness, empathy, and acceptance toward the client. So in this case, we're um, expressing genuineness, like actually meaning and caring about the client while putting yourself in the shoes of the other person. It doesn't, for some people, it can be difficult to exercise empathy, but it is hugely important to because if you just take a second to really listen to the backstory of an individual and hear about all the things, all the experiences, parental influences, etc., that have led them to making the decisions that they do, I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but you can at least be more understanding. And that is the goal of, of genuineness and empathy. All right, let's talk about biomedical therapy. So psychotropic medications have been uh, very productive in assisting individuals who have mental difficulties. And there are multiple categories of psychotropics. So you've got your antipsychotics that are used to treat the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And of course, when I say positive, I don't inherently mean good. I just mean that something is being added to the situation. So this includes hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia by be, by blocking dopamine. Okay. Because the idea when it, uh, the biological perspective when it comes to schizophrenia is that there's too much dopamine uh, within the brain, so this effectively blocks dopamine from binding to its applicable receptors. We've got atypical antipsychotics, which treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, such as withdrawal and apathy, um, as well as catatonia, which catatonia is simply a reduced interest with your environment. So it targets both dopamine and serotonin receptors. Antidepressants, so these are your SSRIs, right? They promote um, neurotransmitter activity and, and prevent the reabsorption of serotonin, so there's more available within the synapses to continue binding to its receptor. So this has been proven to alleviate symptoms of anxiety and or depression in individuals. Um, now, the main difference, one of the main differences, excuse me, between antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents is that antidepressants are a slow growth process. Whenever you take an SSRI, it takes about three to four weeks to really kick in and notice the effects of the medications. Anti-anxiety agents are like your benzodiazepines because they uh, depress central nervous system activity. They kick in within the hour and they alleviate anxiety um, very quickly. Now, these are anti-anxiety agents are something to uh, really be careful of because they can be extremely addicting. And anything that, well, not anything, but the two most common central nervous system depressants are alcohol and benzodiazepines. And whenever you take those consistently and abuse them, and I'm and more so the emphasis is on abuse, if you stop taking these medications or these drugs. Um, they can potentially produce a seizure and can potentially kill an individual. So it's always important to be communicating with your medical provider if you're taking any of these anti-anxiety agents in a substantial manner and especially in conjunction with alcohol because those are commonly abused together and whenever you stop taking them the withdrawals can literally kill people. And I don't, I, I don't say that to try and scare people but it's just important to make that known and make people aware of it. Mood stabilizers. These are uh, 
prescribed to individuals specifically who have uh, bipolar disorder so it can level out their their mood so they're not having such a drastic change from a manic episode to a depressive episode. Stimulants, these improve the ability to focus on a task and maintain attention. These are commonly prescribed to individuals who have ADHD and they are dopamine agonists, so they allow for more dopamine uh, to be within the brain and binding to its applicable receptors. So these are like your Adderalls and other stimulants that increase overall levels of neural activity. Now other uh, therapeutic approaches that are um, presented to individuals in extreme cases include electroconvulsive therapy. And what this does is it induces seizures to help alleviate severe, severe depression. All right, treatment modalities. Individual therapy, group therapy, couples therapy, and family therapy. When an, a counselor goes to school for uh, their degree, you they will pick a particular field of, uh, or uh, I'll, I'll just say a particular niche for lack of better terms, and they will major in clinical mental health, they will uh, major in family therapy, they can major in school counseling, uh, college counseling, things like that. And uh, there are different, uh, I'll say, there are different groups or there are different, you know, I'll just leave it at that. There are just different, there are just different, because I'm not, I don't want to make this more complicated than it needs to be, but there are different ways in which, in which we can uh, help different categories. That includes the family, school, couples, group, as well as just the individual with mental health. So I won't make it more complicated than it, than it needs to be, and I'll leave it at that. Now, whenever you go to your very first counseling session, especially when it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, session, this is what's known as an intake or the initial meeting. So what takes place during your intake is that they will establish or you will establish the presenting problem. They'll come in and they'll say, hey, so-and-so, what brings you in today? And so you'll uh, let them know the presenting problem or problems. They will go over with you confidentiality and they'll say, you know, what you talk about and discuss will stay between us unless you cause a threat to yourself or other people. That is whenever confidentiality can be broken and they have to report that if you plan on harming other individuals or yourself. As well as you will um, go over the treatment plan. What will uh, counseling look like going forward with you? How often will you meet? Uh, and things like that. So frequency of treatment as well as the treatment plan going forward. All right. So a couple modalities, and that's the word that I was searching for earlier, and for some reason it wasn't coming to me. Or So treatment modalities or the format in which you can receive treatment is individual therapy. This is whenever you meet with a, with a counselor one-on-one, -on -one, and typically the sessions will last between 45 minutes to an hour depending on the, on the conversation and how things are going. And as well as group therapy. So in group therapy, this is whenever individuals share a common difficulty. So this is often seen whenever individuals go to a rehabilitation clinic and they are experiencing uh, alcoholism or uh, just drug abuse in general. And so they will uh, discuss uh, with a group, you know, and this is really good for certain people because whenever we're experiencing difficulties, it can feel like we're the only ones in the world experiencing that specific difficulty, but it couldn't be further from the truth. And this will allow other people to feel like they are a part of, not just a part of a community, but that it reduces the shame and isolation they feel with the difficulty that they're going through. All right, so let's talk about substance use and abuse. We're gonna talk about addiction in general, we're going to talk about um, substance-related treatment as well as what makes it effective. So how addiction forms. It's not a one-size-fits-all by any stretch of the imagination. It can, it can be due to – and it can start with just taking it casually and then there's some sort of psychological dependence that forms. It can be 
that something is missing in an individual's life and they're seeking the substance to, to kind of fill that hole. Uh, as well, it can be that an individual starts taking the substance voluntarily and the physical dependence on it happens quickly where an individual enjoy really um, either they enjoy it or their body craves it uh, pretty quickly after uh, after you know a few or several times of taking the substance. But a lot, but there's a plenty of times where it's a combination of the two where it uh, happens to be both a psychological as well as a as a physiological addiction. So yes, individuals initially take the drug voluntarily, but I don't think anybody takes the drug initially with the goal of becoming addicted to it, right? And so chronic substance use can permanently alter the neural structure. So it alters, because it alters your brain chemistry, and the, especially when it comes to the prefrontal cortex that's associated with decision-making and judgment, the individual then with enough and consistent um, uh, uh, usage of the substance, they can become driven to use uh, the drugs or alcohol making it difficult to stop. So it may start off as a psychological addiction and can turn into uh, uh, either strictly a physical dependency. They want to stop, but they can't. And um, Or it can be both, or it can just be psychological. There are a number of outlets and ways that individuals become addicted to a substance. So it happens between about 40 to 60% of individuals whenever they seek treatment and they are um, sober for a period of time. Uh, a good uh, bet is that half of those individuals will relapse. Okay. Now, when it comes to treatment related to substance use, this includes behavior therapy, uh, which will help the individual can help the uh, motivate the individual uh, to participate in the pr uh, treatment program and teach them strategies to deal with cravings and prevent relapse. So medication uses, especially whenever you're first coming off of a substance like alcohol or narcotics, specifically opioids, there are some, certain medications used to safely detox and um, alleviate the withdrawal symptoms as a result. Because the, you know when it comes to those benzodiazepines and those anti-anxiety agents and those that depress central nervous system activity like alcohol, it, these will help prevent seizures and agitation that often occur. Um, and it will prevent and help prevent the reuse of the drug and again manage the, those withdrawal symptoms. Now the goal of uh, is to help uh, overall is to help a person addicted um, to a, a particular substance stop compulsive seeking behaviors and it does require long-term treatment um, and multiple months is encouraged but again affording that mental health treatment and uh, those rehabilitation clinics can get pretty pricey which is why uh, not a lot of individuals stay long enough to receive the adequate tools they need to uh, safely reintroduce themselves into the world. Okay, so again, what makes the treatment effective? Uh, as mentioned, at least three months is recommended for a person to achieve a positive outcome, and there are a few factors involved that make it even more effective. So there's the holistic treatment that whenever you uh, meet with, uh, the counselors and the uh, associates at the at the clinic they address multiple needs, not just the drug addiction. Um, they're trying to get to the root of the problem uh, and navigate that more so to help you with, uh, uh, I guess, the compulsion to take the the drug whenever you're. You know, whenever you're released from rehab, um, and often in rehab you'll have group therapy sessions, and I've already kind of explained how those operate. But you're in there with other individuals who are addicted to substances. It may be the same substance or a mix of different substances, um, but the goal again is to uh, promote affiliation and decrease isolation and hear other people's perspectives and what they're going through. Um, and what they've gone through in their life when it comes to uh, abusing that particular substance. And parental involvement is really important when it comes to 
individuals who are addicted to a substance and going through rehabilitation because it's correlated with a greater reduction in use by teen substance abusers. All right. So that is going to end chapter 16 of the OpenStack Psychology textbook. If you've made it through all chapters and you've made it to the end of this video, I commend you and thank you so very much for watching these videos. Um, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments. Again, my name is Matthew Poole. I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College. If you've enjoyed this series, please subscribe. I may be doing some other videos related to psychology and doing some other courses. And I appreciate your time throughout this process. If you're taking this as a class requirement, um, this is going to be the end of the content that we go through. Congratulations. You have made it through your introduction to psychology. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.